The Complete Life of John Hopkins by O. Henry There is a saying that no man has tasted the full flavor of life until he has known poverty, love, and war. The justness of this reflection commends it to the lover of condensed philosophy. The three condi, tines embrace about all there is in life worth knowing. A surface thinker might deem that wealth should be added to the list. Not so. When a poor man finds a long-bidden quarter dollar that has slipped through a rip into his vest lining, he sounds the pleasure of life with a deeper plummet than any millionaire can hope to cast. It seems that the wise executive power that rules life has thought best to drill man in these three conditions, and none may escape all three. In rural places the terms do not mean so much. Poverty is less pinching. Love is temperate. War shrinks to con, tests about boundary lines and the neighbor's hens. It is in the cities that our epigram gains in truth and vigor, and it has remained for one John Hopkins to crowd the experience into a rather small space of time. The Hopkins flat was like a thousand others. There was a rubber plant in one window. A flea-bitten terrier sat in the other, wondering when he was to have his day. John Hopkins was like a thousand others. He worked at $20 per week in a nine-story, red brick building at either insurance, buckles hoisting and Guinness, Caropody, loans, pulleys, boas renovated, waltz guaranteed in five lessons, or artificial limbs. It is not for us to wring Mr. Hopkins's avu, cat iron from these outward signs that be. Mrs. Hopkins was like a thousand others. The auriferous tooth, the sedentary disposition, the sun, day afternoon wanderlust, the draft upon the delicatessen store for homemade comforts, the furor for department store marked down sales, the feeling of superiority to the lady in the third floor front who wore genuine ostrich tips and had two names over her bell, the mucilaginous hours during which she remained glued to the window sill, the vigi, lant avoidance of the installment man, the tireless patronage of the acoustics of the dumb, waiter shaft, all the attributes of the Gotham flat dweller were hers. One moment yet of sententiousness in the story moves. In the big city large and sudden things happen. You round a corner and thrust the rib of your um, brella into the eye of your old friend from Kootenay Falls. You stroll out to pluck a sweet William in the park and lo, bandits attack you. You are am, violence to the hospital. You marry your nurse, are divorced, get squeezed while short on you. P, S, and D, zero. W, N, S. Stand in the bread line, marry an heiress, take out your laundry and pay your club dues, seemingly all in the wink of an eye. You travel the streets and a finger beckons to you. A handkerchief is dropped for you. A brick is dropped upon you. The elevator cable or your bank breaks, a table dote or your wife disagrees with you. And fate tosses you about like court crumbs and wine opened by an unfeed waiter. The city is a sprightly young stir and you are red paint upon its toy, and you get licked off. John Hopkins sat, after a compressed dinner, in his glove-fitting straight front flat. He sat upon a hornblende couch and gazed, with satiated eyes, at art brought home to the people in the shape of the storm, tacked against the wall. Mrs. Hop, Kins discoursed droningly of the dinner smells from the flat across the ball. The flea-bitten terrier gave Hopkins a look of disgust, and showed a man-hating tooth. Here was neither poverty, love, nor war. But upon such barren stems may be grafted those essentials of a complete life. John Hopkins sought to inject a few raisins of conversation into the tasteless dough of existence. Putting a new elevator in at the office, he said, discarding the nominative noun. And the boss has turned out his whiskers. You don't mean it, commented Mrs. Hopkins. Mr. Whipples, continued John. Wore his new spring suit down today. I liked it fine it's a gray with, he stopped, suddenly stricken by a need that made itself known to him. I believe I'll walk down to the corner and get a five-cent cigar, he concluded. John Hopkins took his bat aid, picked his way down the musty halls and stairs of the flat house. The evening air was mild, and the streets shrill with the careless cries of children playing games con, trolled by mysterious rhythms and phrases. Their elders held the doorways and steps with leisurely pipe and gossip. Paradoxically, the fire escape sup, ported lovers and couples who made no attempt to fly the mounting conflagration they were there to fan.
The corner cigar store aimed at by John Hopkins was kept by a man named Freshmayer, who looked upon the earth as a sterile promontory. Hopkins, unknown in the store, entered and called genially for his bunch of spinach, car fare grade. This imputation deepened the pessimism of Fresh Mayer, but be set out a brand that came perilously near to filling the order. Hopkins bit off the roots of his purchase and lighted up at the swinging gas jet. Feeling in his pockets to make payment, he found not a penny there. Say, my friend, he explained, frankly, I've come out without any change. Hand you that nickel first time I pass. Joy surged in Fresh Mayer's heart. Here was C.O.R., Robberation of his belief that the world was rotten and man a peripatetic evil. Without a word, he rounded the end of his counter and made earnest onslaught upon his customer. Hopkins was no man to serve as a punching bag for a pessimistic tobacconist. He quickly bestowed upon Fresh Mayor a Colorado Maduro eye in return for the ardent kick that be received from that dealer in goods for cash only. The impetus of the enemy's attack forced the Hopkins line back to the sidewalk. There the con, flicked raged. The Pacific wooden Indian, with his carven smile, was overturned, and those of the street who delighted in carnage pressed round to view the zealous joust. But then came the inevitable cop and imminent convenience for both the attacker and attacked. John Hopkins was a peaceful citizen, who worked at rebuses of nights in a flat, but B was not without the fundamental spirit of resistance that comes with the battle rage. He knocked the policeman into a grow. Sayre's sidewalk display of goods and gave Fresh Mayor a punch that caused him temporarily to regret that he had not made it a rule to extend a five-cent line of credit to certain customers. Then Hopkins took spiritedly to his heels down the sidewalk, closely fall, load by the cigar dealer and the policeman, whose uniform testified to the reason in the grocer's sign that read, eggs cheaper than anywhere else in the city. As Hopkins ran he became aware of a big, low, red, racing automobile that kept abreast of him in the street. This auto steered into the side of the sidewalk, and the man guiding it motioned to Hopkins to jump into it. He did so without slackening his speed, and fell into the turkey-red upholstered seat beside the chauffeur. The big machine, with a diminutive, window cough, flew away like an albatross down the avenue into which the street emptied. The driver of the auto sped his machine without a word. He was masked beyond guess in the goggles and diabolic garb of the chauffeur. Much obliged old man, called Hopkins, great, fully. I guess you've got sporting blood in you, all right, and don't admire the sight of two men trying to soak one. Little more and I'd have been pinched. The chauffeur made no sign that he had heard. Hopkins shrugged a shoulder and chewed at his cigar, to which his teeth had clung grimly through, out the melee. Ten minutes and the auto turned into the open carriage entrance of a noble mansion of brown stone and stood still. The chauffeur leaped out and said, Come quick, the lady, she will explain. It is the great honor you will have, monsieur. Ah, that milady could call upon Armand to do this thing. But, no, I am only one chauffeur. With vehement gestures the chauffeur conducted Hopkins into the house. He was ushered into a small but luxurious reception chamber. A lady, young, and possessing the beauty of visions, rose from a chair. In her eyes smoldered a becoming anger. Her high, arched, thread-like brows were ruffled into a delicious frown. Milady, said the chauffeur, bowing low, I have the honor to relate to you that I went to the house of Monsieur Long and found him to be not at home. As I came back I see this gentleman in combat against Bayusay, greatest odds. He is fighting with five, ten, thirty men. Gendarmes, Aussie. Yes, milady, he what you call swat, one, three, eight policemen's. If that Monsieur Long is out, I say to myself, this gentleman, be will serve milady so well, and I bring him here. Very well, Armand, said the lady, you may go. She turned to Hopkins. I sent my chauffeur, she said, to bring my cousin, Walter Long. There is a man in this house who has treated me with insult and abuse. I have complained to my aunt, and she laughs at me. A.R. Man says you are brave. In these prosaic days men who are both brave and chivalrous are few. May I count upon your assistance? John Hopkins thrust the remains of his cigar into his coat pocket. He looked upon this winning creature and felt his first thrill of romance. It was a knightly love.
and contained no disloyalty to the flat with the flea-bitten terrier and the lady of his choice. He bad married her after a picnic of the Lady Label Stickers Union, Lodge No. 2, on a dare and a bed of new hats and chowder all around with his friend, Billy McManus. This angel who was begging him to come to her rescue was something too heavenly for chowder, and as for hats, golden, jeweled crowns for her. Say, said John Hopkins, just show me the guy that you've got the grouch at. I've neglected my talents as a scrapper heretofore, but this is my busy night. He is in there, said the lady, pointing to a closed door. Come, are you sure that you do not falter or fear? Me, said John Hopkins. Just give me one of those roses in the bunch you are wearing, will you? The lady gave him a red, red rose. John Hopkins kissed it, stuffed it into his vest pocket, opened the door and walked into the room. It was a handsome library, softly but brightly lighted. A young man was there, reading. Books on etiquette is what you want to study, said John Hopkins, abruptly. Get up here, and I'll give you some lessors. Be rude to a lady, will you? The young man looked mildly surprised. Then he arose languidly, dexterously caught the arms of John Hopkins, and conducted him irresistibly to the front door of the house. Beware, Ralph Branscombe, cried the lady, who had followed. What you do to the gallant man who has tried to protect me? The young man shoved John Hopkins gently out the door and then closed it. Bess, he said calmly, I wish you would quit reading historical novels. How in the world did that fellow get in here? Armand brought him, said the young lady. I think you are awfully mean not to let me have that street, Bernard. I sent Armand for Walter. I was so angry with you. Be sensible, Bess, said the young man, taking her arm. That dog isn't safe. He has bitten two or three people around the kennels. Come now, let's go tell Auntie we are in good humor again. Arm in arm, they moved away. John Hopkins walked to his flat. The janitor's five-year-old daughter was playing on the steps Hopkins gave her a nice, red rose and walked up, stairs. Mrs. Hopkins was philandering with curl papers. Get your cigar, she asked, disinterestedly. Sure, said Hopkins, and I knocked around a while outside. It's a nice night. He sat upon the hornblende sofa, took out the stump of his cigar, lighted it, and gazed at the grace, full figures in the storm, on the opposite wall. I was telling you, said he, about Mr. Whipple's suit. It's a gray, with an invisible check, and it looks fine. The Cop and the Anthem, by O. Henry, on his bench in Madison Square Soapy, moved uneasily. When wild geese honk high of nights, and when women without sealskin coats grow kind to their husbands, and when Soapy moves uneasily on his bench in the park, you may know that winter is near at hand. A dead leaf fell in Soapy's lap. That was Jack Frost's card. Jack is kind to the regular denizens of Madison Square and gives fair warning of his annual call. At the corners of four streets, he hands his pasteboard to the North Wind, footman of the mansion of all outdoors, so that the inhabitants thereof may make ready. Soapy's mind became cognizant of the fact that the time had come for him to resolve himself into a singular committee of ways and means to provide against the coming rigor and therefore he moved uneasily on his bench. The hibernatorial ambitions of Soapy were not of the highest. In them there were no considerations of Mediterranean cruises, of soporific southern skies drifting in the Vesuvian Bay. Three months on the island was what his soul craved. Three months of assured board and bed and congenial company, safe from Boreas and Bluecoats, seemed to Soapy the essence of things desirable. For years the hospitable Blackwells had been his winter quarters. Just as his more fortunate fellow New Yorkers had bought their tickets to Palm Beach and the Riviera each winter, so Soapy had made his humble arrangements for his annual hegira to the island. And now the time was come. On the previous night three Sabbath newspapers, distributed beneath his coat, about his ankles and over his lap, had failed to repulse the cold as he slept on his bench near the spurting fountain in the ancient square. So the island loomed big and timely in Soapy's mind. He scorned the provisions made in the name of charity for the city's dependents. In Soapy's opinion, the law was more benign than philanthropy. There was an endless round of institutions, municipal and eleemosynary, on which he might set out and receive lodging and food accordant with the simple life. 
But to one of Soapy's proud spirit, the gifts of charity are encumbered. If not in coin, you must pay in humiliation of spirit for every benefit received at the hands of philanthropy. As Caesar had his Brutus, every bed of charity must have its toll of a bath, every loaf of bread its compensation of a private and personal inquisition. Wherefore it is better to be a guest of the law, which though conducted by rules, does not meddle unduly with a gentleman's private affairs. Soapy, having decided to go to the island, at once set about accomplishing his desire. There were many easy ways of doing this. The pleasantest was to dine luxuriously at some expensive restaurant, and then, after declaring insolvency, be handed over quietly and without uproar to a policeman. An accommodating magistrate would do the rest. Soapy left his bench and strolled out of the square and across the level sea of asphalt, where Broadway and Fifth Avenue flow together. Up Broadway he turned and halted at a glittering cafe, where are gathered together nightly the choicest products of the grape, the silkworm, and the protoplasm. Soapy had confidence in himself from the lowest button of his vest upward. He was shaven, and his coat was decent and his neat black. Ready-tied foreign hand had been presented to him by a lady missionary on Thanksgiving Day. If he could reach a table in the restaurant, unsuspected success would be his. The portion of him that would show above the table would raise no doubt in the waiter's mind. A roasted mallard duck, thought Soapy, would be about the thing with a bottle of Chablis, and then camembert, a demitasse and a cigar. One dollar for the cigar would be enough. The total would not be so high as to call forth any supreme manifestation of revenge from the cafe management, and yet the meat would leave him filled and happy for the journey to his winter refuge. But as Soapy set foot inside the restaurant door the head waiter's eye fell upon his frayed trousers and decadent shoes. Strong and ready hands turned him about and conveyed him in silence and haste to the sidewalk and averted the ignoble fate of the menaced mallard. Soapy turned off Broadway. It seemed that his route to the coveted island was not to be an Epicurean one. Some other way of entering limbo must be thought of. At a corner of 6th Avenue electric lights and cunningly displayed wares behind plate glass made a shop window conspicuous. Soapy took a cobblestone and dashed it through the glass. People came running around the corner, a policeman in the lead. Soapy stood still, with his hands in his pockets, and smiled at the sight of brass buttons. Where's the man that done that? inquired the officer excitedly. Don't you figure out that I might have had something to do with it? said Soapy, not without sarcasm, but friendly, as one greets good fortune. The policeman's mind refused to accept Soapy even as a clue. Men who smash windows do not remain to parley with the law's minions. They take to their heels. The policeman saw a man halfway down the block running to catch a car. With drawn club, he joined in the pursuit. Soapy, with disgust in his heart, loafed along, twice unsuccessful. On the opposite side of the street was a restaurant of no great pretensions. It catered to large appetites and modest purses. Its crockery and atmosphere were thick, its soup and napery thin. Into this place Soapy took his accusive shoes and telltale trousers without challenge. At a table he sat and consumed beefsteak, flapjacks, donuts and pie. And then to the waiter be betrayed the fact that the minutest coin and himself were strangers. Now, get busy and call a cop, said Soapy. And don't keep a gentleman waiting. No cop for yous, said the waiter with a voice like butter cakes and an eye like the cherry in a Manhattan cocktail. Hey, Con. Neatly upon his left ear on the callous pavement, two waiters pitched Soapy. He arose, joint by joint, as a carpenter's rule opens, and beat the dust from his clothes. Arrest seemed but a rosy dream. The island seemed very far away. A policeman who stood before a drugstore two doors away laughed and walked down the street. Five blocks, Soapy traveled before his courage permitted him to woo capture again. This time the opportunity presented what he fatuously termed to himself a cinch. A young woman of a modest and pleasing guise was standing before a show window gazing with sprightly interest at its display of shaving mugs and inkstands, and two yards from the window a large policeman of severe demeanor leaned against a water plug. It was Soapy's design to assume the role of the despicable and execrated masher. The refined and elegant appearance of his victim and the contiguity of the conscientious cop 
encouraged him to believe that he would soon feel the pleasant official clutch upon his arm that would ensure his winter quarters on the right little, tight little aisle. Soapy straightened the lady missionary's ready-made tie, dragged his shrinking cuffs into the open, set his hat at a killing cant and sidled toward the young woman. He made eyes at her, was taken with sudden coughs and hymns, smiled, smirked and went brazenly through the impudent and contemptible litany of the masher. With half an eye Soapy saw that the policeman was watching him fixedly. The young woman moved away a few steps and again bestowed her absorbed attention upon the shaving mugs. Soapy followed, boldly stepping to her side, raised his hat and said, Ah there, Bedelia, don't you want to come and play in my yard? The policeman was still looking. The persecuted young woman had but to beckon a finger and Soapy would be practically en route for his insular haven. Already he imagined he could feel the cozy warmth of the station house. The young woman faced him and, stretching out a hand, caught Soapy's coat sleeve. Sure, Mike, she said joyfully, if you'll blow me to a pail of suds, I'd have spoke to you sooner, but the cop was watching. With the young woman playing the clinging ivy to his oak Soapy, walked past the policeman overcome with gloom. He seemed doomed to liberty. At the next corner, he shook off his companion and ran. He halted in the district where by night are found the lightest streets, hearts, vows, and librettos. Women in furs and men in greatcoats moved gaily in the wintry air. A sudden fear seized Soapy that some dreadful enchantment had rendered him immune to arrest. The thought brought a little of panic upon it, and when he came upon another policeman lounging grandly in front of a transplendent theater, he caught at the immediate straw of disorderly conduct. On the sidewalk, Soapy began to yell drunken gibberish at the top of his harsh voice. He danced, howled, raved and otherwise disturbed the welkin. The policeman twirled his club, turned his back to Soapy, and remarked to a citizen. "'Tis one of them Yale lads celebrating the goose egg they give to the Hartford College. Noisy, but no harm. We've instructions to lave them be. Disconsolate, Soapy seized his unavailing racket. Would never a policeman lay hands on him? In his fancy the island seemed an unattainable Arcadia. He buttoned his thin coat against the chilling wind. In a cigar store he saw a well-dressed man lighting a cigar at a swinging light. His silk umbrella he had set by the door on entering. Soapy stepped inside, secured the umbrella and sauntered off with it slowly. The man at the cigar light followed hastily. My umbrella, he said, sternly. Oh, is it? sneered Soapy, adding insult to petit larceny. Well, why don't you call a policeman? I took it. Your umbrella. Why don't you call a cop? There stands one on the corner. The umbrella owner slowed his steps. Soapy did likewise, with a presentiment that luck would again run against him. The policeman looked at the two curiously. Of course, said the umbrella man. That is well. You know how these mistakes occur. I, if it's your umbrella, I hope you'll excuse me. I picked it up this morning in a restaurant. If you recognize it as yours, why I hope you'll. Of course it's mine, said Soapy, viciously. The ex-umbrella man retreated. The policeman hurried to assist a tall blonde in an opera cloak across the street in front of a streetcar that was approaching two blocks away. Soapy walked eastward through a street damaged by improvements. He hurled the umbrella wrathfully into an excavation. He muttered against the men who wear helmets and carry clubs. Because he wanted to fall into their clutches, they seemed to regard him as a king who could do no wrong. At length Soapy reached one of the avenues to the east where the glitter and turmoil was but faint. He set his face down this toward Madison Square, for the homing instinct survives even when the home is a park bench. But on an unusually quiet corner Soapy came to a standstill. Here was an old church, quaint and rambling and gabled. Through one violet-stained window a soft light glowed, where, no doubt, the organist loitered over the keys making sure of his mastery of the coming Sabbath anthem. For there drifted out to Soapy's ears sweet music that caught and held him transfixed against the convolutions of the iron fence. The moon was above, lustrous and serene. Vehicles and pedestrians were few. Sparrows twittered sleepily in the eaves, for a little while the scene might have been a country churchyard. And the anthem that the organist played cemented Soapy to the iron fence, 
for he had known it well in the days when his life contained such things as mothers and roses and ambitions and friends and immaculate thoughts and collars. The conjunction of Soapy's receptive state of mind and the influences about the old church wrought a sudden and wonderful change in his soul. He viewed with swift horror the pit into which he had tumbled, the degraded days, unworthy desires, dead hopes, wrecked faculties and base motives that made up his existence. And also in a moment his heart responded thrillingly to this novel mood. An instantaneous and strong impulse moved him to battle with his desperate fate. He would pull himself out of the mire. He would make a man of himself again. He would conquer the evil that had taken possession of him. There was time. He was comparatively young yet. He would resurrect his old eager ambitions and pursue them without faltering. Those solemn but sweet organ notes had set up a revolution in him. Tomorrow he would go into the roaring downtown district and find work. A fur importer had once offered him a place as driver. He would find him tomorrow and ask for the position. He would be somebody in the world. He would. Soapy felt a hand laid on his arm. He looked quickly around into the broad face of a policeman. What are you doing here? asked the officer. Nothing, said Soapy. Then come along said the policeman. Three months on the island, said the magistrate in the police court the next morning. The Count and the Wedding Guest by O. Henry One evening when Andy Donovan went to dinner at his Second Avenue boarding house, Mrs. Scott introduced him to a new boarder, a young lady, Miss Conway. Miss Conway was small and unobtrusive. She wore a plain, snuffy brown dress and bestowed her interest, which seemed languid, upon her plate. She lifted her diffident eyelids and shot one perspicuous, judicial glance at Mr. Donovan, politely murmured his name, and returned to her mutton. Mr. Donovan bowed with the grace and beaming smile that were rapidly winning for him social, business, and political advancement, and erased the snuffy brown one from the tablets of his consideration. Two weeks later Andy was sitting on the front steps enjoying his cigar. There was a soft rustle behind and above him, and Andy turned his head and had his head turned. Just coming out the door was Miss Conway. She wore a night black dress of crepe de crepe d'oil, this thin black goods. Her hat was black, and from it drooped and fluttered an ebon veil, filmy as a spider's web. She stood on the top step and drew on black silk gloves, not a speck of white or a spot of color about her dress anywhere. Her rich golden hair was drawn, with scarcely a ripple, into a shining, smooth, not low on her neck. Her face was plain rather than pretty, but it was now illuminated and made almost beautiful by her large gray eyes that gazed above the houses across the street into the sky with an expression of the most appealing sadness and melancholy. Gather the idea, girls all black, you know, with the preference for crepe d'oeau, crepe de chine, that's it, all black and that sad, faraway look, and the hair shining under the black veil, you have to be a blonde, of course, and try to look as if, although your young life had been blighted just as it was about to give a hop, skip, and a jump over the threshold of life, a walk in the park might do you good, and be sure to happen out the door at the right moment, Anno, it'll fetch him every time, but it's fierce now, how cynical I am, ain't it, to talk about morning costumes this way. Mr. Donovan suddenly reinscribed Miss Conway upon the tablets of his consideration. He threw away the remaining inch and a quarter of his cigar, that would have been good for eight minutes yet, and quickly shifted his center of gravity to his low-cut, patent leathers. It's a fine, clear evening, Miss Conway, he said. And if the Weather Bureau could have heard the confident emphasis of his tones, it would have hoisted the square white signal and nailed it to the mast. To them that has the heart to enjoy it, it is Mr. Donovan, said Miss Conway with a sigh. Mr. Donovan in his heart, cursed fair weather, heartless weather. It should hail and blow and snow to be consonant with the mood of Miss Conway. I hope none of your relatives, I hope you haven't sustained a loss, ventured Mr. Donovan. Death has claimed, said Miss Conway, hesitating, not a relative, but one who but I will not intrude my grief upon you, Mr. Donovan. Intrude, protested Mr. Donovan. Why, say, Miss Conway, I'd be delighted, that is, I'd be sorry I mean I'm sure nobody could sympathize with you truer than I would. Miss Conway smiled a little smile, and oh, 
It was sadder than her expression in repose. Laugh, and the world laughs with you. Weep, and they give you the laugh, she quoted. I have learned that, Mr. Donovan, I have no friends or acquaintances in this city, but you have been kind to me. I appreciate it highly. He had passed her the pepper twice at the table. It's tough to be alone in New York, that's a cinch, said Mr. Donovan. But, say, whenever this little old town does loosen up and get friendly it goes the limit. Say you took a little stroll in the park. Miss Conway, you think it might chase away some of your mulligrubs? And if you'd allow me? Thanks, Mr. Donovan. I'd be pleased to accept of your escort, if you think the company of one whose heart is filled with gloom could be anyways agreeable to you. Through the open gates of the iron-railed, old, downtown park, where the elect once took the air, they strolled and found a quiet bench. There is this difference between the grief of youth and that of old age. Youth's burden is lightened by as much of it as another shares. Old age may give and give, but the sorrow remains the same. He was my fiancé, confided Miss Conway, at the end of an hour. We were going to be married next spring. I don't want you to think that I am stringing you, Mr. Donovan, but he was a real count. He had an estate and a castle in Italy. Count Fernando Mazzini was his name. I never saw the beat of him for elegance. Papa objected, of course, and once we eloped, but Papa overtook us and took us back. I thought sure Papa and Fernando would fight a duel. Papa has a livery business in Kipsy, you know? Finally, Papa came round, all right, and said we might be married next spring. Fernando showed him proofs of his title and wealth, and then went over to Italy to get the castle fixed up for us. Papa's very proud, and when Fernando wanted to give me several thousand dollars for my trousseau, he called him down something awful. He wouldn't even let me take a ring or any presents from him. And when Fernando sailed, I came to the city and got a position as cashier in a candy store. Three days ago, I got a letter from Italy, forwarded from Kipsy, saying that Fernando had been killed in a gondola accident. That is why I am in mourning. My heart, Mr. Donovan, will remain forever in his grave. I guess I am poor company, Mr. Donovan, but I cannot take any interest in no one. I should not care to keep you from gaiety and your friends who can smile and entertain you. Perhaps you would prefer to walk back to the house? Now, girls, if you want to observe a young man hustle out after a pick and shovel, just tell him that your heart is in some other fellow's grave. Young men are grave robbers by nature. Ask any widow. Something must be done to restore that missing organ to weeping angels and crepe to chine. Dead men certainly get the worst of it from all sides. I'm awfully sorry, said Mr. Donovan, gently. No, we won't walk back to the house just yet. And don't say you haven't no friends in this city, Miss Conway. I'm awful sorry, and I want you to believe I'm your friend, and that I'm awful sorry. I've got his picture here in my locket, said Miss Conway, after wiping her eyes with her handkerchief. I never showed it to anybody, but I will to you, Mr. Donovan, because I believe you to be a true friend. Mr. Donovan gazed long and with much interest at the photograph in the locket that Miss Conway opened for him. The face of Count Mazzini was one to command interest. It was a smooth, intelligent, bright, almost a handsome face, the face of a strong, cheerful man who might well be a leader among his fellows. I have a larger one, framed in my room, said Miss Conway. When we return, I will show you that. They are all I have to remind me of Fernando but he ever will be present in my heart, that's a sure thing. A subtle task confronted Mr. Donovan, that of supplanting the unfortunate count in the heart of Miss Conway. This his admiration for her determined him to do, but the magnitude of the undertaking did not seem to weigh upon his spirits. The sympathetic but cheerful friend was the role he essayed, and he played it so successfully that the next half hour found them conversing pensively across two plates of ice cream, though yet there was no diminution of the sadness in Miss Conway's large gray eyes. Before they parted in the hall that evening, she ran upstairs and brought down the framed photograph wrapped lovingly in a white silk scarf. Mr. Donovan surveyed it with inscrutable eyes. He gave me this the night he left for Italy, said Miss Conway. I had the one for the locket made from this. A fine-looking man, said Mr. Donovan, heartily. How would it suit you, Miss Conway? 
to give me the pleasure of your company to Coney next Sunday afternoon. A month later, they announced their engagement to Mrs. Scott and the other boarders. Miss Conway continued to wear black. A week after the announcement, the two sat on the same bench in the downtown park, while the fluttering leaves of the trees made a dim, kinetoscopic picture of them in the moonlight. But Donovan had worn a look of abstracted gloom all day. He was so silent tonight that Love's lips could not keep back any longer the questions that Love's heart propounded. What's the matter, Andy? You are so solemn and grouchy tonight. Nothing, Maggie. I know better. Can I tell? You never acted this way before. What is it? It's nothing much, Maggie. Yes, it is, and I want to know. I'll bet it's some other girl you were thinking about. All right. Why don't you go get her if you want her? Take your arm away if you please. I'll tell you then, said Andy wisely, but I guess you won't understand it exactly. You've heard of Mike Sullivan, haven't you? Big Mike Sullivan. Everybody calls him. No, I haven't, said Maggie, and I don't want to, if he makes you act like this. Who is he? He's the biggest man in New York, said Andy, almost reverently. He can about do anything he wants to with Tammany or any other old thing in the political line. He's a mile high and as broad as East River. You say anything against Big Mike, and you'll have a million men on your collarbone in about two seconds. Why, he made a visit over to the old country a while back, and the kings took to their holes like rabbits. Well, Big Mike's a friend of mine. I ain't more than deuce high in the district as far as influence goes, but Mike's as good a friend to a little man, or a poor man as he is to a big one. I met him today on the Bowery, and what do you think he does? comes up and shakes hands. Andy, says he, I've been keeping cases on you. You've been putting in some good licks over on your side of the street, and I'm proud of you. While you take to drink, he takes a cigar, and I take a highball. I told him I was going to get married in two weeks. Andy, says he, send me an invitation, so I'll keep in mind of it, and I'll come to the wedding. That's what Big Mike says to me, and he always does what he says. You don't understand it, Maggie, but I'd have one of my hands cut off to have Big Mike Sullivan at our wedding. It would be the proudest day of my life. When he goes to a man's wedding, there's a guy being married that's made for life. Now, that's why I'm maybe looking sore tonight. Why don't you invite him then, if he's so much to the mustard, said Maggie, lightly. There's a reason why I can't, said Andy, sadly. There's a reason why he mustn't be there. Don't ask me what it is for I can't tell you. Oh, I don't care, said Maggie. It's something about politics, of course, but it's no reason why you can't smile at me. Maggie, said Andy presently, do you think as much of me as you did of your as you did of the Count Matsini? He waited a long time, but Maggie did not reply. And then, suddenly she leaned against his shoulder and began to cry to cry and shake with sobs, holding his arm tightly, and wetting the crepe de chine with tears. There, 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 soothed Andy, putting aside his own trouble. And what is it now? Andy, sobbed Maggie, I've lied to you, and you'll never marry me, or love me anymore. But I feel that I've got to tell. Andy, there never was so much as the little finger of a count. I never had a bow in my life, but all the other girls had, and they talked about him, and that seemed to make the fellows like him more. And Andy, I look swell and black you know I do. So I went out to a photograph store and bought that picture and had a little one made for my locket and made up all that story about the count and about his being killed so I could wear black. And nobody can love a liar and you'll shake me, Andy, and I'll die for shame. Oh, there never was anybody I liked but you and that's all. But instead of being pushed away, she found Andy's arm folding her closer. She looked up and saw his face cleared and smiling. Could you, could you forgive me, Andy? Sure, said Andy. It's all right about that. Back to the cemetery for the count. You've straightened everything out, Maggie. I was in hopes you would before the wedding day. Bully girl. Andy, said Maggie, with a somewhat shy smile, after she had been thoroughly assured of forgiveness, did you believe all that story about the count? Well, not to any large extent, said Andy, reaching for his cigar case, because it's Big Mike Sullivan's picture you've got in that locket of yours. The Country of Illusion by O. Henry The cunning writer will choose an indefinable subject, 
for he can then set down his theory of what it is, and next, at length, his conception of what it is not and lo, his paper is covered. Therefore let us follow the prolix and unmapable trail into that mooted country, Bohemia. Granger, sub-editor of Anthox Magaziners, closed his roll-top desk, put on his hat, walked into the hall, punched the down button, and waited for the elevator. Granger's day had been trying. The chief had tried to ruin the magazine a dozen times by going against Granger's ideas for running it. A lady whose grandfather had fought with McClellan had brought a portfolio of poems in person. Granger was curator of the Lion's House of the magazine. That day he had lunched an Arctic explorer, a short story writer, and the famous conductor of a slaughterhouse expose. Consequently, his mind was in a whirl of icebergs, Maupassant, and trichinosis. But there was a surcease and a recourse. There was Bohemia. He would seek distraction there. And, let's see he would call by for Mary Adrian. Half an hour later, he threaded his way like a Brazilian orchid hunter through the palm forest in the tiled entrance hall of the Idalia apartment house. One day the Christiners of apartment houses and the cognominators of sleeping cars will meet, and there will be some jealous and sanguinary knifing. The clerk breathed Granger's name so languidly into the house telephone that it seemed it must surely drop, from sheer inertia, down to the janitor's regions. But, at length, it soared dilatorily up to Miss Adrian's ear. Certainly, Mr. Granger was to come up immediately. A colored maid with an Eliza crossing the ice expression opened the door of the apartment for him. Granger walked sideways down the narrow hall. A bunch of burnt umber hair and a sea-green eye appeared in the crack of a door. A long, white, undraped arm came out, barring the way. So glad you came, Ricky, instead of any of the others, said the eye. Light a cigarette and give it to me. Going to take me to dinner? Fine. Go into the front room till I finish dressing. But don't sit in your usual chair. There's pie in it, meringue. Kappelman threw it at Reeves last evening while he was reciting. Sophie has just come to straighten up. Is it lit? Thanks. There's scotch on the mantelo. No, it isn't. That's chartreuse. Ask Sophie to find you some. I won't be long. Granger escaped the meringue. As he waited, his spirits sank still lower. The atmosphere of the room was as vapid as a zephyr wandering over a Vesuvian lava bed. Relics of some feast lay about the room, scattered in places where even a prowling cat would have been surprised to find them. A straggling cluster of deep red roses in a marmalade jar bowed their heads over tobacco ashes and unwashed goblets. A chafing dish stood on the piano. A leaf of sheet music supported a stack of sandwiches in a chair. Mary came in, dressed and radiant. Her gown was of that thin, black fabric whose name through the change of a single vowel seems to summon visions ranging between the extremes of man's experience. Spelled with an eat it belongs to Gallic witchery and diaphanous dreams. With an it drapes lamentation and woe. That evening they went to the Café André. And, as people would confide to you in a whisper that André's was the only truly bohemian restaurant in town, it may be well to follow them. André began his professional career as a waiter in a Bowery 10 cent eating house. Had you seen him there, you would have called him tough to yourself. Not allowed, for he would have soaked you as quickly as he would have soaked his thumb in your coffee. He saved money and started a basement on his table dote underscore in 8th or 9th Street. One afternoon, André drank too much absinthe. He announced to his startled family that he was the Grand Lama of Thibet, therefore requiring an empty audience hall in which to be worshipped. He moved all the tables and chairs from the restaurant into the backyard, wrapped a red tablecloth around himself, and sat on a stepladder for a throne. When the diners began to arrive, Madame, in a flurry of despair, laid cloths and ushered them, trembling, outside. Between the table's clotheslines were stretched, bearing the family wash. A party of Bohemia hunters greeted the artistic innovation with shrieks and acclamations of delight. That week's washing was not taken in for two years. When André came to his senses, he had the menu printed on stiffly starched cuffs and served the ices in little wooden tubs. Next, he took down his sign and darkened the front of the house. When you went there to dine, you fumbled for an electric button and pressed it. A lookout slid open a panel in the door, looked at you suspiciously, 
and asked if he were acquainted with Senator Herodotus Q. McMilligan of the Chickasaw Nation. If you were, you were admitted and allowed to dine. If you were not, you were admitted and allowed to dine. There you have one of the abiding principles of Bohemia. When Andre had accumulated $20,000 he moved uptown, near Broadway, in the fierce light that beats upon the throne down. There we find him and leave him, with customers in pearls and automobile veils, striving to catch his excellently graduated nod of recognition. There is a large round table in the northeast corner of Andre's at which six can sit. To this table Granger and Mary Adrian made their way. Kappelman and Reeves were already there. And Miss Tooker, who designed the May cover for the Unladies Notifilm magazine, oh. and Mrs. Pothunter, who never drank anything but black and white highballs, being in mourning for her husband, who, oh, I've forgotten what he did died, like as not. Spaghetti weary reader, wouldst take one penny in the slot peep into the fair land of Bohemia? Then look, and when you think you have seen it, you have not. And it is neither thimble riggery nor astigmatism. The walls of the Café André were covered with original sketches by the artist who furnished much of the color and sound of the place. Fair Woman furnished the theme for the bulk of the drawings. When you say sirens and siphons, you come near to estimating the alliterative atmosphere of André's. First, I want you to meet my friend, Miss Adrian. Miss Tooker and Mrs. Pothunter you already know. While she tucks in the fingers of her elbow gloves you shall have her daguerreotype. So faint and uncertain shall the portrait be. Age, somewhere between 27 and high neck evening dresses. Camaraderie in large bunches, whatever the fearful word may mean. Habitat anywhere from Seattle to Terra del Fuego. Temperament uncharted, she let Reeves squeeze her hand after he recited one of his poems. But she counted the change after sending him out with a dollar to buy some pickled pig's feet. Deportment 75 out of a possible 100. Morals 100. Mary was one of the princesses of Bohemia. In the first place, it was a royal and a daring thing to have been named Mary. There are 25 fines and Heloises to one Mary in the country of illusion. Now her gloves are tucked in. Miss Tooker has assumed a June poster pose. Mrs. Pothunter has bitten her lips to make the red show. Reeves has several times felt his coat to make sure that his latest poem is in the pocket. It had been neatly typewritten, but he has copied it on the backs of letters with a pencil. Kappelman is underhandedly watching the clock. It is ten minutes to nine. When the hour comes it is to remind him of a story. Synopsis. A French girl says to her suitor, Did you ask my father for my hand at nine o'clock this morning, as you said you would? I did not, he replies. At nine o'clock, I was fighting a duel with swords in the Bois de Boulogne. Coward, she hisses. The dinner was ordered. You know how the Bohemian Feast of Reason keeps up with the courses. Humor with the oysters. Wit with the soup. Repartee with the entree. Brag with the roast. Knox for Whistler and Kipling with the salad. Songs with the coffee. The slapsticks with the cordials. Between Miss Adrian's eyebrows was the pucker that shows the intense strain it requires to be at ease in Bohemia. Pat must come each sally, underscore remote underscore, an epigram. Every second of deliberation upon a reply cost you a bay leaf. Fine as a hair, a line began to curve from her nostrils to her mouth. To hold her own not a chance must be missed. A sentence addressed to her must be as a piccolo, each word of it a stop which she must be prepared to seize upon and play. And she must always be quicker than a Micmac Indian to paddle the light canoe of conversation away from the rocks in the rapids that flow from the Pyrean Spring. 4. Plotting Reader The handwriting on the wall in the banquet hall of Bohemia is... Uh -uh. The gray ghost that sometimes peeps through the rings of smoke is that of slain old king convention. Freedom is the tyrant that holds them in slavery. As the dinner waned, Hands reached for the pepper cruet, rather than for the shaker of attic salt. Miss Tooker, with an elbow to business, leaned across the table toward Granger, upsetting her glass of wine. Now while you are fed and in good humor, she said, I want to make a suggestion to you about a new cover. A good idea, said Granger, mopping the tablecloth with his napkin. I'll speak to the waiter about it. Kappelman, the painter, was the cut-up. As a piece of delicate Athenian wit he got up from his chair and waltzed down the room with a waiter. That dependent, no doubt an honest, pachydermatous, 
worthy, taxpaying, art despising biped, released himself from the unequal encounter, carried his professional smile back to the dumbwaiter, and dropped it down the shaft to eternal oblivion. Reeves began to make Keats turn in his grave. Mrs. Pothunter told the story of the man who met the widow on the train. Miss Adrian hummed what is still called <laughs> in the cafes of Bridgeport. Granger edited each individual effort with his assistant editor's smile, which meant, great, but you'll have to send them in through the regular channels. If I were the chief now, but you know how it is. And soon the head waiter bowed before them, desolated to relate that the closing hour had already become chronologically historical. So out all trooped into the starry midnight, filling the street with gay laughter, to be barked at by hopeful cabmen and enviously eyed by the dull inhabitants of an uninspired world. Granger left Mary at the elevator in the trackless palm forest of the Idalia. After he had gone, she came down again carrying a small handbag, phoned for a cab, drove to the Grand Central Station, boarded a 12.55 commuter's train, rode four hours with her burnt umber head bobbing against the red plush back of the seat, and landed during a fresh, stinging, Glorious sunrise at a deserted station, the size of a peach crate, called Crocusville. She walked a mile and clicked the latch of a gate. A bare, brown cottage stood twenty yards back. An old man with a pearl-white, Calvinistic face and clothes dyed blacker than a raven in a coal mine was washing his hands in a tin basin on the front porch. How are you, father? said Mary timidly. I am as well as providence permits, Mary, and you will find your mother in the kitchen. In the kitchen a cryptic, gray woman kissed her glacially on the forehead and pointed out the potatoes which were not yet peeled for breakfast. Mary sat in a wooden chair and decorticated spuds with a thrill in her heart. For breakfast there were grace, cold bread, potatoes, bacon, and tea. You are pursuing the same avocation in the city concerning which you have advised us from time to time by letter, I trust, said her father. Yes, said Mary. I am still reviewing books for the same publication. After breakfast, she helped wash the dishes, and then all three sat in straight back chairs in the bare-floored parlor. It is my custom, said the old man, on the Sabbath day to read aloud from the great work entitled The Apology for Authorized and Set Forms of Liturgy by the ecclesiastical philosopher and revered theologian Jeremy Taylor. I know it, said Mary blissfully, folding her hands. For two hours the numbers of the great Jeremy rolled forth like the notes of an oratorio played on the violoncello. Mary sat gloating in the new sensation of racking physical discomfort that the wooden chair brought her. Perhaps there is no happiness in life so perfect as the martyrs. Jeremy's minor chords soothed her like the music of a tom-tom. Why, oh why, she said to herself, does someone not write words to it? At eleven they went to church in Crocusville. The back of the pine bench on which she sat had a penitential forward tilt that would have brought St. Simeon down, in jealousy, from his pillar. The preacher singled her out and thundered upon her vicarious head the damnation of the world. At each side of her an adamant parent held her rigidly to the bar of judgment. An aunt crawled upon her neck, but she dared not move. She lowered her eyes before the congregation a hundred-eyed Cerberus that watched the gates through which her sins were fast thrusting her. Her soul was filled with a delirious, almost a fanatic joy, for she was out of the clutch of the tyrant, freedom, dogma and creed pinioned her with beneficent cruelty, as steel braces bind the feet of a crippled child. She was hedged, adjured, shackled, shored up, straight-jacketed, silenced, ordered. When they came out the minister stopped to greet them, Mary could only hang her head and answer, yes, sir, and no, sir, to his questions. When she saw that the other women carried their hymn books at their waists with their left hands, she blushed and moved hers there, too, from her right. She took the three o'clock train back to the city. At nine, she sat at the round table for dinner in the Café André. Nearly the same crowd was there. Where have you been today? asked Mrs. Pothunter. I have phoned to you at twelve. I have been away in Bohemia answered Mary, with a mystic smile. There. Mary has given it away. She has spoiled my climax. For I was to have told you that Bohemia is nothing more than the little country in which you do not live. If you try to obtain citizenship in it, 
At once the court and retinue pack the royal archives and treasure and move away beyond the hills. It is a hillside that you turn your head to peer at from the windows of the through express. At exactly half past eleven Kappelman, deceived by a new softness and slowness of repost and Perry and Mary Adrian, tried to kiss her. Instantly she slapped his face with such strength and cold fury that he shrank down, sobered, with the flaming red print of a hand across his leering features. And all sounds ceased, as when the shadows of great wings come upon a flock of chattering sparrows. One had broken the paramount law of Shambohemia, the law of... The shock came not from the blow delivered, but from the blow received. With the effect of a schoolmaster entering the playroom of his pupils, was that blow administered. Women pulled down their sleeves and laid prim hands against their ruffled side locks. Men looked at their watches. There was nothing of the effect of a brawl about it. It was purely the still panic produced by the sound of the axe of the fly cop, conscience hammering at the gambling house doors of the heart. With their punctilious putting on of cloaks, with their exaggerated pretense of not having seen or heard, with their stammering exchange of unaccustomed formalities, with their false show of a light-hearted exit, I must take leave of my bohemian party. Mary has robbed me of my climax, and she may go, but I am not defeated. Somewhere there exists a great vault miles broad and miles long more capacious than the Champagne Caves of France. In that vault are stored the anticlimaxes that should have been tagged to all the stories that have been told in the world. I shall cheat that vault of one deposit. Minnie Brown, with her aunt, came from Crocusville down to the city to see the sights. And because she had escorted me to fishless trout streams and exhibited to me open plumbed waterfalls and broken my camera while I jollied in her village, I must escort her to the hives containing the synthetic clover honey of town. Especially did the custom-made bohemia charm her. The spaghetti wound its tendrils about her heart. The free red wine drowned her belief in the existence of commercialism in the world. She was dared and enchanted by the rugose wit that can be churned out of California claret. But one evening, I got her away from the smell of halibut and linoleum long enough to read to her the manuscript of this story which then ended before her entrance into it. I read it to her because I knew that all the printing presses in the world were running to try to please her and some others. And I asked her about it. I didn't quite catch the trains, said she. How long was Mary in Crocusville? Ten hours and five minutes, I replied. Well then, the story may do, said Minnie. But if she had stayed there a week, Kappelman would have got his kiss. The Day Resurgent by O. Henry I can see the artist bite the end of his pencil and frown when it comes to drawing his Easter picture, for his legitimate pictorial conceptions of figures pertinent to the festival are but four in number. First comes Easter, pagan goddess of spring. Here his fancy may have free play. A beautiful maiden with decorative hair and the proper number of toes will fill the bill. Miss Clarice St. Vavasour, the well-known model, will pose for it in the Lethargo Gallagher, or whatever it was that Trilby called it. Second, the melancholy lady with upturned eyes in a framework of lilies. This is magazine covery, but reliable. Third, Miss Manhattan in the Fifth Avenue Easter Sunday Parade. Fourth, Maggie Murphy with a new red feather in her old straw hat, happy and self-conscious, in the Grand Street turnout. Of course, the rabbits do not count, nor the Easter eggs, since the higher criticism has hard-boiled them. The limited field of its pictorial possibilities proves that Easter, of all our festival days, is the most vague and shifting in our conception. It belongs to all religions, although the pagans invented it. Going back still further to the first spring, we can see Eve choosing with pride a new green leaf from the tree in Hikaskerka. Now, the object of this critical and learned preamble is to set forth the theorem that Easter is neither a date, a season, a festival, a holiday, nor an occasion. What it is you shall find out if you follow in the footsteps of Danny McCree. Easter Sunday dawned as it should, bright and early, in its place on the calendar between Saturday and Monday. At 5.2 for the sun rose, and at 10.30 Danny followed its example. He went into the kitchen and washed his face at the sink. His mother was frying bacon. She looked at his hard, smooth, knowing countenance as he juggled with the round cake of soap, 
and thought of his father when she first saw him stopping a hot grounder between second and third 22 years before on a vacant lot in Harlem, where the La Paloma apartment house now stands. In the front room of the flat Danny's father sat by an open window smoking his pipe, with his disheveled gray hair tossed about by the breeze. He still clung to his pipe, although his sight had been taken from him two years before by a precocious blast of giant powder that went off without permission. Very few blind men care for smoking, for the reason that they cannot see the smoke. Now, could you enjoy having the news read to you from an evening newspaper unless you could see the colors of the headlines? Tis Easter Day, said Mrs. McCree. Scramble mine, said Danny. After breakfast, he dressed himself in the Sabbath morning costume of the Canal Street Importing House Dray chauffeur frock coat, striped trousers, patent leathers, gilded trace chain across front of vest and wing collar, rolled brim derby and butterfly bow from Sconstein's between 14th Street and Tony's fruit stand, Saturday night sale. You'll be going out this day, of course, Danny, said old man McCree, a little wistfully. Tis a kind of holiday, they say. Well, it's fine spring weather. I can feel it in the air. Why should I not be going out? Demanded Danny in his grumpiest chest tones. Should I stay in? Am I as good as a horse? One day of rest my team has a week. Who earns the money for the rent and the breakfast you've just eat? I'd like to know. Answer me that. All right, lad, said the old man. I'm not complaining. While me two eyes was good, there was nothing better to my mind than a Sunday out. There's a smell of turf and burning brush coming in the windy. I have me tobacky. A good fine day and wristy, lad. Times I wish your mother had learned to read. So I might hear the rest about the hippopotamus, but let that be. Now, what is this foolishness he talks of hippopotamuses? asked Danny of his mother, as he passed through the kitchen. Have you been taking him to the zoo? And for what? I have not, said Mrs. McCree. He sets by the windy all day. Tis little recreation a blind man among the poor gets at all. I'm thinking they wander in their minds at times. One day he talks of grease without stopping for the most of an hour. I looks to see if there's lard burning in the frying pan. There is not. He says I do not understand. Tis weary days, Sundays, and holidays and all. For a blind man, Danny, there was no better nor stronger than him when he had his two eyes. Tis a fine day, son. Enjoy yourself, A.G. Inst. the morning. There will be cold supper at six. Have you heard any talk of a hippopotamus? Asked Danny of Mike, the janitor, as he went out the door downstairs. I have not, said Mike, pulling his shirt sleeves higher. But, tis the only subject in the animal, natural, and illegal lists of outrages that I've not been complained to about these two days. See the landlord, or else move out if you like. Have ye hippopotamuses in the lease? No, then. It was the old man who spoke of it, said Danny. Likely there's nothing in it. Danny walked up the street to the avenue, and then struck northward into the heart of the district where Easter Modern Easter, in new, bright raiment leads the Pascal March. Out of towering brown churches came the blithe music of anthems from the choirs. The broad sidewalks were moving parterres of living flowers, so it seemed when your eye looked upon the Easter girl. Gentlemen, frock-coated, silk-hatted, gardeniaed, sustained the background of the tradition. Children carried lilies in their hands. The windows of the brownstone mansions were packed with the most opulent creations of Flora, the sister of the Lady of the Lilies. Around a corner, white-gloved, pink-gilled and tightly buttoned, walked Corrigan, the cop, shield to the curb. Danny knew him. Why, Corrigan, he asked, is Easter. I know it comes the first time you're full after the moon rises on the 17th of March, but why? Is it a proper and religious ceremony, or does the governor appoint it out of politics? Tis an annual celebration, said Corrigan, with the judicial air of the third deputy police commissioner, peculiar to New York. It extends up to Harlem. Sometimes they has the reserves out at 125th Street. In my opinion, tis not political. Thanks, said Danny. And say did you ever hear a man complain of hippopotamuses? When not specially in drink, I mean. Nothing larger than sea turtles, said Corrigan, reflecting. And there was wood alcohol in that. Danny wandered. 
The double, heavy incumbency of enjoying simultaneously a Sunday and a festival day was his. The sorrows of the hand twaller fit him easily. They are worn so often that they hang with the picturesque lines of the best tailor-made garments. That is why well-fed artists of pencil and pen find in the griefs of the common people their most striking models. But when the Philistine would disport himself, the grimness of Melpomene, herself, attends upon his capers. Therefore, Danny set his jaw hard at Easter, and took his pleasure sadly. The family entrance of Dugan's Café was feasible. So Danny yielded to the vernal season as far as a glass of Bach, seated in a dark, linoleumed, humid back room, his heart and mind still groped after the mysterious meaning of the springtime jubilee. Say, Tim, he said to the waiter, why do they have Easter? Skidoo, said Tim, closing a sophisticated eye. Is that a new one? All right. Tony Pastors for you last night, I guess. I give it up. What's the answer to apples or a yard and a half? From Dugan's Danny turned back eastward. The April sun seemed to stir in him a vague feeling that he could not construe. He made a wrong diagnosis and decided that it was Katie Conlon. A block from her house on Avenue A, he met her going to church. They pumped hands on the corner. Gee, but you look doompish and dressed up, said Katie. What's wrong? Come away with me to church and be cheerful. What's doing at church? asked Danny. Why, it's Easter Sunday. Silly. I waited till after eleven expectin'. You might come around to go. What does this Easter stand for, Katie? asked Danny gloomily. Nobody seems to know. Nobody is blind as you, said Katie with spirit. You haven't even looked at my new hat. And skirt. Why, it's when all the girls put on new spring clothes. Silly. Are you coming to church with me? I will, said Danny. If this Easter is pulled off there, they ought to be able to give some excuse for it. Not that the hat ain't a beauty. The green roses are great. At church the preacher did some expounding with no pounding. He spoke rapidly, for he was in a hurry to get home to his early Sabbath dinner. But he knew his business. There was one word that controlled his theme resurrection. Not a new creation, but a new life arising out of the old. The congregation had heard it often before. But there was a wonderful hat a combination of sweet peas and lavender, in the sixth pew from the pulpit. It attracted much attention. After church, Danny lingered on a corner while Katie waited, with peak in her sky-blue eyes. Are you coming along to the house? She asked. But don't mind me. I'll get there all right. You seem to be studying a lot about something. All right. Will I see you at any time specially, Mr. McCree? I'll be around Wednesday night as usual, said Danny turning and crossing the street. Katie walked away with the green roses dangling indignantly. Danny stopped two blocks away. He stood still with his hands in his pockets, at the curb on the corner. His face was that of a graven image. Deep in his soul something stirred so small, so fine, so keen and leavening that his hard fibers did not recognize it. It was something more tender than the April day, more subtle than the call of the senses, purer and deeper rooted than the love of woman, for had he not turned away from green roses and eyes that had kept him chained for a year? And Danny did not know what it was. The preacher, who was in a hurry to go to his dinner, had told him, but Danny had had no libretto with which to follow the drowsy intonation. But the preacher spoke the truth. Suddenly Danny slapped his leg and gave forth a hoarse yell of delight. Hippopotamus, he shouted to an elevated road pillar. Well, how is that for a bum guess? Why? Blast my skylights. I know what he was driving at now. Hippopotamus. Wouldn't that send you to the Bronx? It's been a year since he heard it, and he didn't miss it so very far. We quit at 469 BC, and this comes next. Well, a wooden man wouldn't have guessed what he was trying to get out of him. Danny caught a cross-down car and went up to the rear flat that his labor supported. Old man McCree was still sitting by the window. His extinct pipe lay on the sill. Will that be you, lad? He asked. Danny flared into the rage of a strong man who was surprised at the outset of committing a good deed. Who pays the rent and buys the food that is eaten in this house? He snapped, viciously. Have I no right to come in? Yuri, a faithful lad, said old man McCree with a sigh. Is it evening yet? 
Danny reached up on a shelf and took down a thick book labeled in gilt letters, The History of Greece. Dust was on it half an inch thick. He laid it on the table and found a place in it marked by a strip of paper. And then he gave a short roar at the top of his voice and said, Was it the hippopotamus you wanted to be read to about then? Did I hear ye open the book? said old man McCree. Many and weary be the months since my lad has read it to me. I dinno, but I took a great likings to them Greeks. You left off at a place. Tis a fine day outside, lad. Be out and take rest from your work. I have gotten used to me chair by the windy and me pipe. Pelpeloponesus was the place where we left off, and not Hippopotamus, said Danny. The war began there. It kept something doing for thirty years. The headline says that a guy named Philip of Macedon, in 338 BC, got to be boss of Greece by getting the decision at the Battle of Shercherania. I'll read it. With his hand to his ear, wrapped in the Peloponnesian War, old man McCree sat for an hour, listening. Then he got up and felt his way to the door of the kitchen. Mrs. McCree was slicing cold meat. She looked up. Tears were running from old man McCree's eyes. Do you hear our lad reading to me? He said. There is none finer in the land. My two eyes have come back to me again. After supper, he said to Danny, Tis a happy day, this Easter, and now you will be off to see Katie in the evening. Well enough. Who pays the rent and buys the food that is eaten in this house? said Danny, angrily. Have I no right to stay in it? After supper, there is yet to come the reading of the Battle of Corinth, 146 BC, when the kingdom, as they say, became an inintegral portion of the Roman Empire. Am I nothing in this house? 